Today on City Line, she was imprisoned in Iran, a journalist convicted of espionage. Nearly a year after her return to the United States, Roxana Sabiri is telling her story. Hello everyone, I'm Karen Holmes Ward. Welcome to City Line. She was a journalist living in Iran when she was suddenly arrested in January of 2009, thrown into prison and convicted of espionage. A high stakes drama surrounding Roxana Sabiri began to unfold, involving everyone from journalist organizations to the White House and the highest reaches of the Iranian government. Well, what exactly happened to the young Iranian Japanese American reporter at the center of this global firestorm? And what has she learned from her experience? Roxana's new book, Between Two Worlds, chronicles her extraordinary journey to Iran and back. Roxana is here with us in the studio today, but first let's look back at a piece that ABC News ran on May 11, 2009, the day Roxana was released from prison. For Iranian-American journalist Roxana Sabari, today couldn't have come soon enough. Because after a five-hour appeal behind closed doors, an appeal that lasted longer than her trial, the judge suspended her eight-year sentence. Speaking to the press, her father says, today Roxana is a free woman. Sabari has been locked up in this prison since January after she was arrested for allegedly buying a bottle of wine. Iranian authorities then charged her with working illegally as a journalist. The accusations didn't stop there. She later confessed to and was convicted of spying for the U.S. government. An admission in an interview last month with George Stephanopoulos, Sabari's parents said was made under duress. She said they uh, first they coerced her, they scared her, they said that they, uh, they even threatened her that if she doesn't say uh, they will do, they will kill her. The U.S. government called the accusations baseless and demanded her release. President Obama himself spoke out against the charges. She is an American citizen, and I have complete confidence that she was not engaging in any sort of espionage. Part of the deal for Siberi's release includes banning her from working in the country as a journalist for the next five years. But she will be allowed to leave Iran immediately. Lama Hassan, ABC News, London. Roxana. What a story. Did you ever imagine that you would be in the center of such a firestorm? Not at all. Um, I was amazed when uh, there was this much attention on my case as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now tell us exactly what happened. T tell us how the whole thing uh, mm -hmm. uh, unfolded. Well, I was working on a book about Iranian society and I was almost done with that book and getting ready to move on to the next chapter of my life. I was about to leave the country. It was in January 2009 when um, somebody rang my doorbell and I looked at the monitor on the wall and it was a black and white image of a man standing outside uh, downstairs who said, Khana Miss Saberi, which means Miss Saberi. I said, yes. He said, you have a letter. So I thought this must be the mailman and I buzzed him in and he came upstairs. I cracked the door open a little bit and he handed me a, a slip of paper through the crack and then he just stood there. I thought, this is very strange. The mailman doesn't just stand there and hand me a slip of paper. It's not even a letter. And I started reading it, and two words jumped out at me. The words, Evan, prison, the most notorious prison in Iran. And I told him, I'm, I'm sorry, can I can have a moment. My Farsi reading skills aren't very good. Um, I just need a moment to read this. And I tried to shut the door, but he wouldn't let me because his foot was propping it open. Mm. And then he pushed it open and came in, and three other plainclothes men came in after him. So was it uh, what we would think of as an arrest warrant that he was um, putting through the door? Perhaps that is what the what the legal was, definition was, would be. I don't. Yes, I uh -huh. don't know. <laughs> it just said the words "heaven prison" and some mm -hmm. other words, but I was very um, uneasy at the time. I couldn't uh, figure, figure, figure it, it, out. it out. But they started going through all my belongings and confiscating whatever who, they wanted. Who, who were who were these people? Who was they? They were intelligence agents. Mm -hmm. These four men. And they said, just stand in one place of your living room where we could see you. Um, they took my cell phone. Uh, 
they took some books, some notebooks, my laptop, computer, my passports, because I was in Iran on my Iranian passport, and they took my American passport as well. And they said, cooperate and you'll be fine. We're going to take you elsewhere for questioning. If you cooperate, we'll bring you home. But if not, we're going to take you to Evan Prison. So uh, at that point, what was going through your mind? I was very scared, um, especially when they took me from my apartment and none of my neighbors was around. Usually there were kids playing in the hallways or something. The, care the caretaker of the building wasn't there, but even if I'd screamed and somebody had heard me, maybe nobody would have come to my aid. And these men looked like intelligence agents because they were plainclothes men. And also um, they could have been armed. Why were they coming for you? Well, what they said, they took me to an unmarked building for questioning, and they asked me questions about a variety of topics, but the focus of their questions was mostly on that book that I was writing about Iran. Mm. And they said, um, why did you interview so many people? And I said, well, I needed to interview a wide variety of people in Iranian society to get a good cross-section of society to show outsiders um, a, a balanced perspective of Iran. I can't just interview a few people and say they represent the whole society. They said, why did you interview reformists? I said, well, I also interviewed some conservatives. And they basically said, you shouldn't have done that either. Um, Who paid you to write your book, they asked me. I said, nobody paid me. I don't even have a publisher yet. I'm paying for this out of my own pocket. They knew I wanted to leave the country soon and to publish the book overseas if I could. And they didn't seem to like that, because in Iran, if you want to work on a book, interview people for a book, you don't need government permission. But if you want to publish it in Iran, you do. And oftentimes, books will get censored in the process. So perhaps my captors thought, if I publish this overseas, it's outside of their censoring range. Mm -hmm. But over several hours of questioning, I found out that their definition of cooperate, they said you have to cooperate, was that I was supposed to confess that this book was a cover for espionage for the United States. Now, what were they charging you with? They had you in detention. What was the, the charge? You've, you've explained that they had mm -hmm. questions about the book, but what was the quote unquote official charge? Well, later on, the official charge was something like endangering national security through um, espionage or something like that. And so there are some reports that suggested that they picked you up initially because you were purchasing wine? That was, um, that was a rumor and because, um, well, m when I was able to call my parents for the first time after several days in prison, my um, captor said you can only call them if you tell them that you were arrested for wine and you don't know where you are and um, they shouldn't talk to the media and if you tell them all this you'll be freed in a day or two. So uh, that's what I was telling my parents when I called them, but this intelligence agent was standing right next to me. I couldn't, you know, not follow his orders, but I was trying to hint to my parents that this was all a lie. I wasn't arrested for alcohol, um, and I knew where I was. I was in Evan Prison in Tehran, but I couldn't, uh, I, I, I was trying to hint to my father that these are all lies that I'm telling you, but he didn't really understand. How so did your parents find out? Uh, I found out much later that um, it was about a month after my arrest that my father went uh, to the public. He went to the media with my story about my disappearance. He said our daughter's been gone for Because they hadn't been in touch with you, had not Since spoken to you. Since that phone call, right. And mm -hmm. they were very worried. And after they went public, the Iranian authorities finally announced uh, that I was in their custody and I was in Evan prison. Have you ever had run in uh, with the authorities prior to this no. incident? No. You know, I think uh, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to this story, and in, in America we uh, have what we call due process and, you know, the ability to make a phone call and, mm -hmm. you know, read in your Miranda rights and all of those things that it's are supposed to be nothing. None of that. And I asked also, I said, I'd, I'd like a lawyer um, on my first day and my second day, and they said, no, you can't have a lawyer. I said, well, when can I have a lawyer? They said, when your interrogation is done. I said, when is my interrogation going to be done? They said, when you cooperate. And I kept telling them, well, I'm not a spy. My book's not a cover for espionage. Mm -hmm. You have my laptop. Just mm -hmm. read it and see the interviews that I used were in the book. And I tried to make it as balanced as possible. But they said, no, we don't believe you. You're lying to us. Must have been um, not only scary, but just, uh, just, just a nightmare to have found yourself in this situation. It is one of those nightmares when they say, I wish I could wake up from, from a nightmare. That is exactly how it was. Now you're going to stay uh, with us for the rest of the half hour and tell us more about your story. Roxana Saberi will be with us when we return.